So first of all, um, also welcome from my side to this online workshop on ground penetrating radar modeling. So first of all, thanks um, to the um, organizers um, that I've given the opportunity to present some of my work here. So um, as Craig already said, my name is Philip and I work together with Jens Tronike in his working group at the Institute of Geosciences at the University of Potsdam. And the last talk of today will deal with 3D GPR data simulated across a realistic sedimentary model. And what I want to introduce to you is the modeling, the analysis, and also some applications of this synthetic 3D GPR data. So as an overview, um, I want to start with showing you what we typically do with ground penetrating radar in uh, sedimentary field applications to give, uh, to pose a framework for my modeling studies. And then I want to show you how we, uh, or what uh, sedimentary model we used um, and how we got it. Um, then I will focus, of course, um, on the modeling process using GPR Max. And then I will show you, of course, the results and some applications of our um, simulated data, including the analysis and sedimentological interpretation. And at the very end, I will draw some conclusions upon the work I've presented to you today. So to begin with, um, I want to show you a very typical field study, which is performed in our um, working group. And this one is here, uh, took place on the island of Spiekeroog, which is a part of the East Frisian Islands in the very northwestern part of Germany. And there we find a typical uh, dunous environment. Um, so quite um, typical target for ground penetrating radar. And in the course of a diploma thesis some years ago, there was a typical GPR field campaign performed, including some high resolution 3D GPR measurements covering an area of 85 times 60 meters. And the idea here is that we want to use these GPR data in order to um, perform a structural imaging and a sedimentological interpretation in order to characterize the depositional history History of such a dunious environment. At the very beginning of each field study, there is a choice to make, and we all know that this is the choice of GPR frequency. And this always poses a compromise between the resolution and the degree of detail on the one hand and the penetration depth on the other hand. And before acquiring large 3D GPR data volumes, there are typically field tests performed um, in order to obtain the correct frequency, uh, which is then used for 3D GPR imaging. So what we see here are um, ex data examples from Spieker Oak with the two, uh, with the three typical um, frequencies we use. So this is the 50, 100, and 200 um, megahertz antennas. Uh, and what we can already see here is that we um, resolve typical reflection and interference phenomena on multiple spatial scales depending on the source frequency. And what we also see is that they more or less show quite comparable penetration depths. To complement such common offset data, we also perform CMP measurements, so common midpoint um, uh, data. And if we compare them here in a qualitative um, way, we see that using different frequencies also in this configuration helps us resolving depositional structures at different spatial scales. To analyze such CMP data in a more quantitative way, we perform spectral velocity analysis to estimate a velocity model, which then can be used, for example, for migration of the corresponding common offset data. And here we see the velocity spectrum of the 200 megahertz CMP of which we can obtain a velocity depth model, which more or less illustrates a two layer case here uh, with a sharp velocity contrast at around three meters depth, um, which then coincides here with the groundwater table at the island of Spiekeroog. To perform a structural imaging, we have a more or less typical processing flow for our 3D GPR data, which includes some time zero correction, some spatial and frequency filters, and also an amplitude scaling. But the key point here is that we perform a 3D Kirchhoff migration where we put our velocity model obtained from the CMPs in. And at the very end of that a processing flow, we end up with a 3D GPR depth image, which then can be analyzed and interpreted. 
the boxes which are shown here with these dashed surroundings apply to field data only. So if we have a look at the synthetic data later on, um, these uh, specific steps are, will not be performed. So to show you some results of such a typical uh, campaign, we see here um, first that the 200 megahertz um, um, antenna was used to um, obtain the 3D uh, data volume at this uh, island of Spiekeroog. And what we see here are some typical profile slices or a typical time slice of the um, 3D migrated and topographically corrected um, 3D data volume. And at this time slice, for example, we see some manual interpretations here. And what we can nicely see is that we resolve the dunes and also their progradation um, um, over the years here. And on the left hand side, we see something we call a GPR facious interpretation, um, which is a typical sedimentological interpretation approach, which then can be used, for example, to delineate different depositional environments in a manual fashion. To analyze the 3D GPR data a little bit more in detail, um, we can also pick some horizons which could be tracked throughout the whole data volume. And this is what we see here. So we see here a manually picked 3D horizon, which then is the uh, top of the progradation phases we just saw in the uh, slide before. So this is what we typically do when we have um, field campaigns um, using 3D GPR data. And this directly leads me to the motivation of my work and also for the rest of the talk, which is um, which is synthetic data then. And as we all know, and as we um, already heard, um, the last days is that subsurface model and any resulting geophysical data sets play an important role in order to perform feasibility studies or to plan field campaigns or to explore the wide field of geophysical data inversion. But what's the most, um, what's the key point for me is that we can use these um, synthetic data on the one hand to test um, our processing and interpretation techniques, for example, the ones I've already shown you. And what is more important is that we can use them as uh, a reference when we try to develop novel processing analysis and interpretation techniques. In seismics, for example, there are different 2D and, of course, 3D reference models and the corresponding synthetic data sets for numerous geological settings, and they are somehow used in a standardized way, and the use is also more or less good practice, if you want so. Uh, and I show you here one very famous example from the early stages, which is the Mamuzi velocity model, of which also 3D formulations uh, exist for approximately 20 years now, and on the right-hand side, one uh, uh, of the according seismic depth images. On the contrast, um, in contrast to this, uh, for ground penetrating radar, there have not been um, such models, especially in 3D for a long time. And I think the reason for this is that um, only um, with the novel GPU acceleration, which is featured in GPR Max for approximately three years now, um, enables us um, to perform a more or less time efficient modeling of large and uh, densely sampled 3D GPR data sets for the first time. And this is what we um, used to obtain a first publicly available synthetic um, GPR data set, um, which we published together with the underlying sedimentary model. But um, I will come to this later on. So basically this figure here outlines the rest of my talk. So I want to show you how we can get such a sedimentary model and how we can prepare this in order to be input for 3D GPR modeling uh, in GPR Max, how we can process our data to end up with a GPR depth image of which I show you here the 100 megahertz version. And using this synthetic data, I want to clarify in the end how our typical GPR field studies um, and their interpretation can benefit from analyzing such synthetic GPR data. So to begin with, we start with the sedimentary model, of course. Uh, and in the next slides, I want to show you how we can use outcrop-based data to obtain a three-dimensional porosity model, how we can make this porosity model a little bit more realistic, and how we can perform a petrophysical translation in order to end up with electrical parameter models, which we then can use as input for GPR Max. 
So our database comes from an aquifer analog study at the Herden gravel pit, which is located at the very southwestern part of Germany near to the Swiss border, which was performed by Bayer, Communion and their colleagues um, uh, in 2011. And basically we find there are sandy to gravelly uh, fluvial glacial deposits and this gravel pit has been excavated and a sedimentological mapping and interpretation was performed. Um, on top of this, there was a series of digitized 2D outcrop photographs taken, of which we see an example here on the right hand side. Using samples from this gravel pit, there were laboratory measurements uh, performed um, to obtain the hydrological parameters of the gravel pit, so the porosity phi and the hydraulic conductivity kf, based on which this gravel pit was subdivided into a different hydrophages, of which is one shown here, for example, so this hydrophages Sx, which is a pure sand in this case here. So using these digitized outcrop photographs in a 3D geostatistical reconstruction yielded a freely available 3D hydrophages model of the Hatton gravel pit, which is shown on this slide here. So the different colors denote the 10 different hydrophages we find in this model. And to ease the interpretation, I grouped them into some poorly sorted matrix supported gravels, which are shown in the brownish colors, some alternating gravels, which are shown in the greenish and yellowish colors. And in red, we see some well sorted gravel, coarse sand, and also some small portions of pure sand. Analyzing this sedimentary model a little bit more in detail, we see that we find a variety of typical sedimentary structures at multiple spatial scales. So for example, we see here some accretionary elements, including graded or cross beddings in the genetic units one, two, and also four. We see what I think is the most striking features in the sedimentary models, which are some cut and fill elements, which are included in the genetic units three and also five. So three and five. And on top of our model, we have some continuous sub-horizontal gravel sheets building this genetic unit six here. So as I already said, for each of these hydrophages, we have the representative porosity values. And on top of this, we also have their ranges. So kind of certain, uh, uncertainty estimate for each of these hydrophages, which come from laboratory measurements, and they are available alongside this um, hydrophages model. So combining this um, um, hydrophages model and the representative porosity values, of course, yields a representative porosity model, which we see here. What we know is that typically porosity varies at a lot of or over uh, different spatial scales. So here what we see is that the hydrophages um, show uniform porosity values throughout the entire model. So basically we, we have just 10 different porosities in this quite large um, subsurface volume here. And if we, for example, think back to the outcrop photograph we just saw, we can say, okay, this is only partially realistic. And in order to um, simulate realistic GPR data, we generated a more realistic porosity model. And this is how we did it. So uh, taking the fact that numerous petrophysical properties in such sedimentary environments, so for example, the porosity show fractal characteristics, we simulated a spatially correlated Gaussian random fields for each of these hydrophages, so a total of 10 um, spatially correlated random fields using the turning bands algorithm as proposed by Emery and Lantre Jules. And then we weight the um, respective random fields um, using the ranges. So the uncertainty estimates for porosity and added them um, to the representative model. Um, and this yields a model which shows facious internal heterogeneities. And if we look at the difference between these two models, we see um, that they, on the one hand, show a spatial correlation, and on the other hand, that they are um, um, that the um, magnitude of these um, um, and heterogeneities varies with um, the or, or scales with the um, uncertainty we have from the lab measurements. So to analyze this a little bit more in detail, we see here again on the left hand side, this porosity model, but in a 3D perspective view, illustrating these spatial correlations. 
And on the right hand side, we see the facious internal porosity distributions. And what we see here is that they now are characterized by a Gaussian shape each. And when we analyze this a little bit more in detail, we see that the mean values of these distributions scale with the representative porosity values from the lab measurements and that their shape. So for example, the standard deviation um, scales with the porosity ranges. So this can be seen then as a quite realistic porosity distribution, which is just based on something we have seen in the outcrop. So to model GPR data, we need the electrical parameter models of the subsurface. Um, and hence, we performed a petrophysical translation of our porosity model, um, assuming freshwater saturated facies here. And this allows us to use quite standard two component mixture models in which we um, um, use typical values for such unconsolidated sediments. And after in doing so, applying the Archie's equation, we end up with a model for the electrical resistivity. And in this distribution, then we see values ranging between uh, 70 and 550 ohm meters. And by uh, the application of the CRIM model, we obtain the um, velocity distribution in the subsurface ranging between 0.06 and 0.095 meters per nanoseconds. And these two, um, Veloc or parameter distributions can be regarded as quite typical for such a freshwater saturated um, sedimentary system. So now we have everything well prepared to start the modeling process, but as I already said in the really beginning, we want to use our graphic cards to do so. So this is why we have to um, make some preliminary considerations before we start modeling. As we all know, we want to use uh, GPR max, which solves Maxwell's equations using the finite difference time domain method. And if we have a look at the size and at the distribution here in our model, we should, would first ask ourselves um, at which scale would we investigate such a system in the field, so using which frequencies. And as we all know, especially in 3D, finite difference time domain modeling demands huge computational resources in both time and storage. At the same time, we have to ask ourselves which of these frequencies can be modeled in a meaningful um, and efficient way. So the idea is that we want to use the same source frequencies we would also apply in the field, so 50, 100, and 200 megahertz. Um, yeah directly from this, we can calculate, uh, considering the minimum velocity in our model, we can uh, directly calculate the model discretization. And here I used um, the criterion that the model discretization has to be equal a tenth of the smallest wavelengths propagating through our model. So this ends up with a discretization of 5, 2.5, and 1.25 centimeters. Directly from this model discretization results, of course, the model size, which is then approximately 10, 80, and 900 million cells. And what we see here is that um, if we lower our model discretization uh, by a factor of two, then of course, in a three-dimensional space, our model gets bigger by a factor of eight. So, and what we also have to consider is that at each iteration, this whole model has to be solved and the complete model has to fit onto a single GPU RAM for the modeling process. So to pose an example for this, if we take for um, the um, resolution of 2.5 centimeters, we end up with a model size of 425 to the power of three cells. So this is basically um, 80 millions. And we always have to consider that on top of this, um, there will come approximately 10% of model size, um, which surrounds our model on each side where the PMLs um, have to be placed. And of course, we also have to consider that an air region has to be uh, added on top. So and then the required storage already exceeds the RAM of most of the modern GPUs. And if we think about processing time, um, we end up with a, um, with a delta T from the CFL criterion of approximately 0.05 nanoseconds. And this means that we will have a 4,000 samples or more if we model a 200 nanoseconds trace. So basically we have to solve our model 4,000 times to end up with a single GPR trace afterwards. And considering this, we, have to we will encounter large simulation times even with this novel GPU acceleration. <laughs> 
At the same time, we have to ask ourselves what are the available resources we have. And um, in my workstation, I have an NVIDIA GeForce 1070 as well as two NVIDIA Tesla K80 with a RAM of 11 gigabytes each. And what I can tell you is that the size for these models uh, for the 100 and the 200 megahertz data exceed the GPU RAM of each of these GPUs. So we have to ask now, how can we model these different frequencies in a time and storage efficient way if we have these GPUs at hand? And of course, we have to consider what do we want to have as GPR data after our modeling exercises. And as we would have expected in a, uh, in a um, field campaign, we want to have densely sampled reflection data sets across um, the model surface. So here's some modeling and geometrical parameters. So as a source, we use a, a Hertz in dipole and a, a Rica, emitting a Rica wavelet. Um, we adjust a little bit the time window depending on the frequency and the same holds for the source receiver offset. What's more interesting is that um, the, the model geometry, we have a total of 51 profiles um, across the whole model surface with an inline trace spacing of 10 centimeters for the 50 megahertz and five centimeters for the 100 and 200 megahertz. In between the respective profiles, we have a, a, a spacing of 20 centimeters, which then leads to a total number of traces of approximately 8,000 for the 50 megahertz and 16,000 for the 100 and 200 megahertz data sets. Additionally, as we would also have done it in the field, we simulate some common midpoint gathers in the very center of our model with a trace spacing of 0.05 meters. What I can tell you is that modeling the 50 megahertz data set uh, works in a single run. So it fits as a single GPU and the calculation time for this is then approximately one week for these 8,000 traces. So as the other two models do not fit the GPU RAM, we have to run the 100 and 200 megahertz simulation using some kind of submodels. And here the question, what are the requirements for these submodels to deliver meaningful modeling results? And what I mean with meaningful is that if we do all the effort and model 3D J, uh, GPR data, we also want that the GPR data we look at afterwards show 3D effects so that they have a three-dimensional character. So before formulating suitable modeling strategies in order to decompose our model uh, domain, we first have to examine such 3D effects. And in this case, I mean, 3D effects are everything which is related to energy originating from out of plane of a typical um, GPR profile. So um, for example, as I said, if we have the 100 megahertz um, model, the, our model size is 90 million cells, which exceeds our GPU RAM. So we want to decompose our model, but at the same time, maintain the 3D character and the resulting data. And to examine such 3D effect, we did the following. So we extracted submodels like this at three different locations at our model, um, which have a size of seven times eight times eight meters. And in the very center of this model, we put a small GPR profile. And then we model GPR data with um, this sub or across this submodel fully containing 3D structures. And then we iteratively decrease the amount of 3D structures until we reach the 2.5D case. So basically where the only structures found in this model are those right beneath the GPR profile. And we denote the amount of 3D structures here with a delta Y 3D. So in this case, we see that the um, 3D structures extend two meters to either side of the GPR profile. So delta Y 3D is um, two meters in this case. To have the model equally sized all the time, we fill the outermost part um, of our model with replicates of the outermost XZ planes here. And at each step, as I said, we simulate a GPR profile. To analyze the resulting GPR data, we calculate mean RMS amplitude values for each respective GPR profile. And this is what we see here on the left-hand side. To ease the interpretation of this plot, we normalize these values to the 3D case. So basically where this whole model here contains 3D structures and delta Y 3D equals four meters. 
what we can see is that our GPR data clearly exhibits 3D effects, and this becomes clear as for delta Y 3D is 1.5 or bigger, we have no deviations of our RMS values uh, uh, when compared to the full 3D case, whereas for smaller delta Y 3D, we see a scatter in our values up to approximately 25% when compared to the um, full 3D case. So what we can learn from this is on the one hand that 3D modeling is re uh, worth the effort for such a complex sedimentary model and is indispensable to fully capture the 3D events in the resulting GPR data. And what we can also learn is that the source of reflected energy extends approximately 1.5 meters in the cross-line direction of a GPR profile. And this um, we can then use to formulate suitable uh, modeling strategies. So to start with, we um, um, used the, um, these um, um, observations to have a modeling strategies for the 100 megahertz data. So as I said, to solve our RAM problem, we have to decompose our model. And we did so by modeling central profiles across three overlapping submodels, which are shown down here. So we have here, for example, a submodel ranging from two to eight meters, and we only model the central profiles between four and six meters. And thus we assure a distance between the profiles and the outermost parts um, of the 3D structures of two meters or more. And thus we maintain the 3D character and the resulting GPR data wherever applicable. And as we now have three independent models, we are also, it is also possible that we can use three GPUs simultaneously and thus decrease the modeling time to approximately one month. For the 200 megahertz data, it's not as easy um, because as I already indicated, the model discretization now is twice as high as for the 100 megahertz data. So we are now yet here um, at a model discretization of 1.25 centimeters. So the 3D model is then eight times bigger than for 100 megahertz. And to have this 200 megahertz data set, we um, um, uh, used a moving model approach. So we decompose our initial model into approximately 16,000 independent submodels around the trace positions of the 100 megahertz data set. And these submodels have a size of seven times two times 2.5 meters plus PML and air. To, um, and um, but we just model the single trace in the center of each of these submodels to again maintain the 3D character uh, as we are two meters away from either side of the 3D structures. And after doing so, we move our submodel by, for example, an inline trace spacing of five centimeter, cut another model, just simulate this trace in the center, and we repeat this approximately 16,000 times. And then we end up with a calculation time of approximately two weeks, uh, no, would be nice, 10 weeks using um, two NVIDIA Tesla K80 simultaneously. And what I can tell you here is that um, this model we see here with a resolution of 1.25 centimeters is basically the maximum which fits onto such, a, uh, such an NVIDIA Tesla K80. So this far, we have now modeled a 50, 100, and 200 megahertz data sets. And now we can, can have a look um, uh, at the results. And also, I want to show you how we can apply uh, now these GPR data. So to begin with, we see here the modeling results as they basically pop out out of GPR max. And we see here for the three different frequencies, a 2D slide uh, uh, across our um, 3D GPR data set. And if we have a look at them, we see that they show a realistic appearance and lots of typical sedimentary reflection patterns we already recognize when we think about the model we put in. We see some continuous horizontal and dipping events. We see loads of diffractions and interference phenomena. And as we would have expected it, um, the vertical and horizontal resolution increase with the source frequency. To complement this data, as I said, um, we also modeled some CMP data, which we saw, um, see here on the respective right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, we see the, result, uh, uh, we see the results of uh, according um, spectral velocity analysis. 
what we can see first is that um, all of these spectra more or less um, show comparable RMS velocity functions with, um, scattering around 0.085 meters per nanoseconds. When analyzing these spectra a little bit more in detail, we see that already the 50 megahertz data um, can um, highlight the main subsurface architecture. So we see five distinct peaks uh, in the spectrum, and these can be interpreted as the uh, interfaces between the main six genetic units we saw in the beginning in the hydrophaceous model. If we now increase our source frequency, we uh, increase the resolution in data and spectra and thus get also information on the internal structuring. And especially if we have a look at the 200 megahertz data, we see that we also get increasing interference patterns, for example here, which then um, might lead to some possible misinterpretation in the according spectra. So what I want to say with, with that is that these um, three frequencies here complement each other and are best um, interpreted all together. Um, as this gives a quite nice um, understanding of what's happening in the subsurface. So now we can use the velocity from these CMP measurements here or measurements here um, in order to um, process the corresponding um, common offset data using the processing flow I've shown you in the beginning. And in doing so, we end up with um, the GPR depth images um, of the three different frequencies, which I show here at a representative profile and depth slice together with the GPR velocity model. And again, here I show these um, six main genetic units already indicated in the hydrophaceous model. When looking at these data, we see that using the 50 and 100 megahertz data, we can nicely delineate the main structures in the subsurface, and especially the 100 megahertz data already indicate some internal structuring, for example, here where we find these cut and fill sequences. 200 megahertz data show numerous reflection patterns, and especially if we have a look um, at the um, depth slice here, we see that basically all the internal structures found in the subsurface model have been resolved. To analyze this a little bit more in detail, we see here the GPR velocity model directly put onto the GPR profile slices, and we see that Using um, this um, more or less standard processing, we can um, accurately image um, the depth, the shape, the dip, and the spatial extent of the sedimentary features found in the subsurface at various spatial scales, of course, depending on the source frequency. To put a little bit more emphasis on the three-dimensional character of um, the model GPR data, we see them here in the same perspective view together with the GPR velocity model. And again, as I already said multiple times, all these um, source frequencies can provide structural information on the sedimentary system on various spatial scales. So to put this a little bit in a nutshell, I would say that we can use such 50 megahertz data to image the main interfaces to get a first idea about how the subsurface architecture looks like, whereas the 100 megahertz always um, pose a compromise between the main and internal structure. And in the 200 megahertz, we have much information on internal structures, but if we only had them at hand, it might be quite hard to distinguish the main interfaces and we would be lost in detail if we have a look um, at um, such a, whoop, such a um, uh, GPR um, image only. So to put this in a nutshell, I would say, uh, the same as for the CMP data. So we get the best understanding of the um, subsurface if we um, analyze such data sets all together. And to finalize a little bit this qualitative comparison between the input data and the model GPR depth images, we will now travel from top to bottom through the velocity model and the depth images uh, to get a nice impression on how the different subsurface features are resolved by um, the different um, frequencies. So now start, we go from top to bottom, and now we can compare a little bit how the different features um, here are um, imaged by our GPR. So, and as already indicated, quite a lot of times. Um, so we see basically everything what happens in the subsurface in the 200 megahertz data. So loads of 
um, of internal features, whereas with the 50 or 100 megahertz data, we have something like a filter which shows us just the main structures in the subsurface. So, and I think there's always an advantage of each of these frequencies. So there's no better or worse. So, and to analyze the uh, modeling results a little bit more in a quantitative way, I mimicked something we would also do um, in an according field campaign. So I interpreted um, the 100 um, megahertz depth image in an, um, using this horizon-based approach we already saw for the field example in the beginning. So I manually identified and tracked um, continuous reflections throughout the whole data volume. And then I interpret them in terms of GPR horizons to end up with a 3D image of the subsurface stratigraphy like this. And now when we can compare this, for example, with our input model, and this is what is shown here. So on the left hand side, we see two example GPR horizons, which I just picked. And on the right hand side, we see the associated interfaces in the hydrofacious model with the same color scaling for the depths. And what we can learn from this is that um, we can well image the interfaces up to four meters depth so I can track them throughout the whole 3D volume by hand. And what we can also see is that on, um, the depth trends and also the absolute values here um, are in well agreement with the input um, subsurface model. Of course, then I can perform also a manual GPR facious interpretation on, and I did this here uh, at an example um, 2D slice. Um, and then we can use this here to characterize and reconstruct some depositional pro processes which took um, place at the Hatton field site. But as uh, indicated a lot of times, such sedimentological interpretations are performed in a manual fashion. And as you can imagine, this is quite laborious and the results are subjective as they are to some extent based on the interpreter's experience. So in this case on mine. And this leads me to the last um, small part of um, my talk today, which is the current research. And what we want to use these synthetic data now for is we want to um, obtain some 3D GPR facious model in a more automated way by classifying GPR attributes. And the resulting facious models are then more objective and reproducible. And in order to obtain them, we want to adapt um, a workflow which showed quite nice example for a, a which showed some quite nice um, results for a 2D examples into 3D. So starting with our GPR depth image, we want to calculate some textural attributes in 3D, um, perform a principal component analysis, and then we want to classify this PCI, um, this principal component feature space in order to end up with a 3D GPR facious model, which has then been calculated in a, let's say data-driven way. So, and to begin with, um, I used the 50 megahertz steps image, which is shown here again, and I extracted um, GPR texture attributes using the 3D um, gray level co-occurrence matrix or GLCM. So, and um, with that, I can calculate a total of 17 attributes of which I show three prominent examples here. So this is the entropy, the energy, and the dissimilarity of the input um, GPR depth image. And what we can see in these attributes is that they highlight the main textural patterns uh, and variations we see in the GPR depth image. In order to um, reduce the dimensionality and also the redundancy um, in this uh, 17 dimensional attribute feature space, we perform a principal component analysis and just use the dominant principal component of the attribute feature space, which are shown here in a typical k-means clustering algorithm of which we see the three cluster solution on the right hand side. And this yields a reproducible uh, facious model then, which comprises the major classes of the textural features we have in our 50 megahertz depth image. And if we combine, if we compare this now with the input velocity model, we have again in the same perspective view, we see 
that the facious model we calculated in a data-driven way is in quite well agreement um, with the input model as it highlights the major textural variations we find in our um, subsurface. So, and with that, um, I can conclude on my talk. So what I've shown you is that a time efficient 3D modeling of um, GPR data uh, is possible in GPR Max. And what I've also shown you is that we can use um, our synthetic data to successfully test our typical processing flow. Um, the results um, show or highlight the pros and cons of the different frequencies um, of the GPR to um, characterize such sedimentary systems. And what we've seen a lot of times is that analyzing these uh, multi-frequency data uh, altogether um, gives complementary results and thus yields a comprehensive understanding of the investigated sedimentary systems. So it would be best practice um, to always acquire um, different frequencies, which has been never easier than today, for example, using the um, novel array systems available on the market. And what I've shown you at last is that um, some advanced attribute-based interpretation techniques show some first promising results and are of course under uh, constant further development. So for your interest, um, as I already indicated in the beginning, the sedimentary model and the 100 megahertz um, data set are publicly available on Mendeley data. So you will get there by just scanning this QR code or um, asking me afterwards. And the associated research paper can be accessed uh, over Mendeley data, or um, you always already find it here on computers and geosciences. And an expanded abstract, which is more dealing with the multi-frequency um, um, aspect of these modeling exercise will be published soon, hopefully, in the expanded abstract of the GPR 2020, which was to be held at Golden this year. So, and here we have some references, so basically data, abstract, and um, 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 my paper. And here these um, references might be interesting also for you, as these are the guys um, who prepared um, this 3D hydrophaceous model and also provide the subsurface parameters. Um, and with this summarizing slide, I want to thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions or if I can um, yeah, just clarify something, then feel free to ask now. Thank you very much. <laughs>